This episode is brought to you by Paycor, the HR and payroll software made for leaders. It's never been harder to recruit, hire, and engage workers. That's why HR leaders and frontline managers depend on Paycor for all things people management, from onboarding and performance reviews to compensation and benefits. Learn more at paycor.com slash leaders. Hey, y'all. I hope you're having a great day, not just a good day. And today is day number five of Alabama Rush. And it's I'm not someone who spends a lot of time on TikTok, but August is different because that is when the candy-colored, amped-up, wildly unhinged world of sorority rush goes online, especially at the University of Alabama. So for today's OOTD, my dress is shell po, my heels are open edit, my earrings are Kendra Scott's, and they're my mom's. They are wishing me luck today. My necklaces are the same Tiffany and Kendra from every day. You could watch these outfit of the day TikToks or honestly pretty amazing dance routines until you go blue in the face or crimson, whatever. TikTok has sort of become, I would say, the dominant speech platform in the United States right now. That is Forbes reporter Emily Baker White. And frankly, Emily owns the TikTok beat. It has 150 million American users. People use it for an average of 90 minutes a day, which for listeners who use TikTok, no, you don't intend to spend 90 minutes a day, but you're there on your couch after work and just 45 minutes has gone by without you even noticing that you opened your phone. The last time I talked to Emily was before my annual Rush Talk watching, back in the spring when the conversation about TikTok was very different. Not so much outfit of the day, more will this app be banned in America? TikTok CEO Shoji Chu was hauled in front of Congress to testify about his company's links to China. Our approach has never been to dismiss or trivialize any of these concerns. We have addressed them with real action. The bottom line is this. American data stored on American soil by an American company overseen by American personnel. And then everybody went on summer vacation or something. Everybody except Emily, who got her hands on a draft deal from last year between TikTok and the U.S. government, showing what the company was willing to do to keep operating in the U.S. So today on the show, we're going to take you inside those negotiations, what they mean for TikTok and for regulating social media, and whether the government might be asking for surveillance powers that go too far. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. 
It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company & Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. For a while this year, TikTok seemed like it was in true jeopardy. There was the congressional hearing and a government demand that TikTok's China-based parent company, ByteDance, sell the app or face a ban. Then the storm seemed to just fizzle. And according to Emily, TikTok has spent the past several months growing. Quietly expanding, um, really trying to increase their footprint in e-commerce, giving Amazon a little bit of heartburn. Um, they they really they do want to get more into shopping and e-commerce. Those are areas that they've had much more success in overseas and especially in Asia. Both the Chinese version of TikTok, Douyin, um, has much more e-commerce in it, but also the TikTok app in other Asian markets has had a lot more success in e-commerce. And there's this hope that they can take that success and figure out how to modify the systems just enough to sort of bring that type of shopping to Western markets. Hasn't totally worked yet, but they had to, you know, throw a lot of pasta at the wall before they figured out exactly what was going to work to make TikTok explode. And, And they threw a sufficient amount of pasta at the wall to make that happen. So... There, there was legislation after the hearing. I'm thinking about Mark Warner, senator from Virginia. His Restrict Act seemed aimed at, at TikTok, but it sort of fizzled out. I wonder if that gave TikTok some breathing room to do things like quietly focus on e-commerce. Yeah, I mean, TikTok's approach to the hearing was very much uh, a pivot to offense. So they came out and they said, we have 150 million American users in the United States. More than 5 million American businesses are on TikTok. And in a way, they were they were directly making a sort of too big to ban appeal. And if you were watching Wednesday's Republican debate, you might have seen an ad for TikTok. It has changed my life tremendously. None of this would have happened without TikTok. Yeah. It's all part of the company's wider charm offensive how Americans love it, how it helps small businesses, et cetera, et cetera. That was interesting because I think we've sort of seen, we've seen a lot of talk about small businesses from Facebook and Google, right? They say, you don't really want to regulate us in a way that's actually going to uproot the massive amount of commerce that we bring to the United States. And I think we saw TikTok making the same argument. Um, and it's it's sort of reached the size where it really is sort of deeply ingrained in, in a lot of commerce here. And I, I think we we saw them trying to play that card. On the Restrict Act, I know that it got a lot of pushback early on from sort of civil libertarian constituencies who were worried that the way that the law was drawn was really broad. And um, even if it wasn't the intention of, of Senator Warner or some of the other sponsors on the bill, it could be taken in a way that would allow the government to sort of in a much more invasive way, police what we're doing online. And there was all of this sort of pushback on the Restrict Act. Senator Warner came out and said, this is not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to come after citizens. This is about regulating companies, not individual people. But as far as I know, he didn't actually, there there weren't actual like markup changes to the legislation. And so I wonder if there if there were an effort to really meaningfully redraw this law to sort of address those concerns whether it would be more palatable to people but but it really it is summer congress does like to go on vacation like the rest of us but i think um i'm curious whether there will be an effort to bring the restrict act back one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you is that you do not seem to have gone on vacation based on your reporting. You got your hands on the draft of a deal between TikTok and CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which basically fences and approves what foreign entities can do here. And it outlined what TikTok would have to do to keep operating in the U.S. Can you tell us what was in it? Yeah, this draft agreement was really interesting. It was nearly 100 pages long. 
of of legal use, which was really fun for me as someone who went to law school and was a lawyer and now hasn't, I haven't been one for quite a while. It would give the government much broader power over TikTok, both in what it can access inside TikTok sort of internal decision making and deliberations and what it can actually largely like what it can veto um, in, in a way that just struck me as not remotely like the way any of our other major speech platforms are are regulated. And so the way the agreement was structured, it gives a lot of power to what it calls the CMAs or CFIUS monitoring agencies. The CFIUS monitoring agencies for each CFIUS national security agreement, it, it depends deal to deal exactly what agencies we're talking about. But I think it's usually DOJ, DOD, Treasury, the agencies that were mainly leading the negotiation with the company. This draft contract, which it's a year old, we don't know how it's changed, um, did not yet designate which CMAs we were talking about. But again, I think DOJ, DOD, Treasury are likely. And the types of power that it gave to the CMAs were broad and interesting. Generally, it was framed as something called non-objection power. What does that mean? It is it is a cousin of approval power, but it is a more passive cousin of approval power. So if you give an agency non-objection power, you basically notify them that you're going to do something. And unless they actually come and affirmatively say, we object to this, you're fine. Some amount of time passes. And if they haven't said anything, you can move ahead. Um, and so there was a lot of non-objection power in this agreement. My understanding is that this is not distinct to this agreement, CFIUS agreements often frame things in terms of non-objection power. One of the most interesting specifics from this contract, though, is that the CMAs would have non-objection power over changes to platform policies, including content policies, which means that if TikTok wanted to make a material change to their content policies, they wanted to change the rules about what speech is allowed on the platform, they would have to notify the CMAs in advance And if the CMAs had objection, they could stop that from going into effect and sort of require the company to work with them to address any concerns that they might have about the change. Now, that's probably okay. It probably wouldn't come up that much in most administrations, but recent history has shown that we cannot necessarily assume what the next administration is going to look like or what their priorities might be. And so reading this contract, like, reading any contract with the government, we should all imagine what to us is the craziest possible next administration and then ask what would they be able to do under this contract. There's one part of the draft agreement that really stands out. It's the creation of a third-party executive security committee operating in total secrecy from ByteDance. It would require TikTok's USDS division, which is the sort of separate entity that would be in charge of dealing with decisions about U.S. users' private information and the recommendations that they receive, that entity would have to have a security committee, which would operate in secrecy from ByteDance, that would make decisions about sort of security issues. And those people would have a tiered fiduciary duty. Their first fiduciary duty would be to the national security of the United States, as defined by the CMAs, which we don't know exactly which they are yet, but we know they're executive branch agencies. Um, And only after that, they would have a sort of normal fiduciary duty to this for-profit entity that is like running TikTok in the United States. When we come back, that whole election thing throws a wrench in this process. This episode is brought to you by Paycor. Paycor empowers leaders to build winning teams. With Paycor, leaders can recruit, onboard and train employees, set goals, and drive performance. If you're a leader, everyone depends on you. Who do leaders depend on? Paycor. Learn more at paycor.com slash leaders. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. 
I'm Josh Levine, the host of Slate's podcast, One Year. In our new season, we're firing up our flux capacitors and taking you way back. 1955. 1955. We'll bring you 1955's weirdest, wildest, and most captivating stories. You'll learn about forgotten pioneers, like the TV weather girls who took the country by storm. A cute, sexy young woman was very appealing, and I can quite understand why. And you'll discover moments from the past that resonate deeply with the present. Like how a bizarre conspiracy theory infected the nation's politics. Oh my God, they're trying to establish a prison camp. This is going to be Siberia, USA. One year, 1955. Coming August 31st, wherever you get your podcast. I think if you're a listener listening to this, it's like an alphabet soup of agencies and committees. And no, but I think, but I think this gets at something really important, right? There are layers upon layers upon layers of agreements in this draft plan. You also got to see some of the comments between ByteDance and and the government lawyers. And I, I wonder if that's revealing it all when they look at all of these kind of plans and contingencies and, you know, fences that the government is is trying to put a, around this? Like, what do their comments tell you about the potential for a deal like this to take shape? Yeah. So there was one really interesting comment um, from, from the ByteDance lawyers to the Civius lawyers that talked about how they wanted to make sure that to be reductive about it, that that CFIUS or the, the CMAs could not come after ByteDance under this agreement just because the recommendations algorithm showed content that they didn't like. And that, I think, sort of gets to this, this core question of we've got a speech platform here. We've got the government having a lot of sort of insight and control over that speech platform. And, and I think ByteDance's lawyers were saying like, Hey, we we can we can maybe stomach like a lot of the structural stuff, but we want to make really clear that just because the recommendations algorithm, which recommends all sorts of things to all sorts of people, um, might recommend some content you don't like, that's enough. That's not enough for you to sort of come come screaming in a disagreement and say that that we have done something wrong. Well, yeah, like what what if the the recommendation algorithm is recommending posts from people who are sharply critical of the U.S. government. Like, how would that fly? Under our constitution, that is absolutely allowed. And that is something that we right. see from all these other recommendations algorithms. And and that is, I think, I think ByteDance and the U.S. government today would say that's protected speech. And if the recommendations algorithm wants to recommend that content, that is great for it. Um, we definitely don't want to get into a situation somewhere down the line where some future administration would try to curtail that because that's a really, really fundamental right under the First Amendment. The fundamental right under the First Amendment, I would say. I mean, I think there's, and I don't want to be too kind of dramatic about it, but there is a level of irony here that that in attempting to make sure that that China or the Chinese government doesn't influence or censor or promote certain kinds of content, the U.S. is opening up the possibility for them to influence, censor, promote different kinds of content. And I just, I wonder what to do with that. I think that's the central tension here. Our legal system and even the SIFI system, which is which is largely out of public view, um, we have judicial review in this country that is very different from what they have in China. We have a yes. lot more checks and balances on government abuse here than they do in China, and that's very important. We should also always be vigilant about sort of government abuse when it comes to speech everywhere, um, I- including in the United States. And I think one of the central tensions of, of this draft document and of the sort of common interplay one of those central tensions is just about like practicability. Like, can you run a company this way? And we see by dance pushing back on that. But but the other is really, I think, on the the company's independence when it comes to speech issues. And if I were if I worked for the U.S. government, my core question would be: How do we craft something here that does not give the government 
direct sort of power over speech considerations. What language can we add? What can we sort of specify to make sure that no future administration could try to use this very, very, very powerful engine, this tool, this thing, um, in a way that could sort of warp discourse to their own political or financial gain? And I think that's you know, that, that, that is the question about TikTok. It is so big and so powerful that anybody who can is going to try to, to get a piece of that and use it for their own benefit. And I think we're seeing this tug between governments and, and what I would hope the U S government would try to do is stop that and push back on the idea that the government should have that kind of control. You know, I have covered CFIUS reviews in the past when I covered the Treasury Department, and they are like the most boring things in the world. When I They were about foreign financial institutions. But this is different because it so directly affects consumers, regular consumers who are probably not thinking about this in the slightest. And I, I wonder if that is precedent setting, that the fact that this is a media company, a content company with a direct line into people's pockets and hands. No, I, I I think it is very different than a lot of the other companies that have been subject to CFIUS review and sort of the subjects of CFIUS review. Um, a, a lot of them don't directly touch end consumers and, and they generally don't touch on speech issues. And the fact that this one does, I mean... Most CFIUS reviews and negotiations also don't take this long. It is the biggest and gnarliest one, I believe, uh, that that they have ever dealt with. And, and, you know, of course, we're sitting here in August 2023 and there's no deal, right? And we don't know if there will ever be a deal. And so maybe this draft document is a relic of a negotiation that that hasn't been open really hmm. once now. There was reporting right before the hearing. TikTok told media organizations that the government had come to them, that CFIUS had come to them and said, yeah, ByteDance is going to have to sell. They've got to sell or face a ban. But that was six months ago. And we're not right. seeing anyone saying that anything is going to be banned. And so I, I think... I think the parties are playing a game of chicken right now. TikTok is playing a game of chicken. ByteDance is playing a game of chicken with the U.S. government. And it seems like every day that we move closer to a national presidential election, uh, it seems less likely that President Biden will try to ban an enormous speech platform. But does that mean that the government that is so concerned about the national security risks here that they won't sign the CFIUS agreement, that same government is like totally cool with just chilling for 18 months and not having any sort of official regulation of this big company that they say is a threat. That also seems weird. So I don't know what's going on. You you just sort of foreshadowed two of my questions. Number one is the political reality around this. Like it seems very hard to consider that the administration would do this heading into a presidential election. But then I guess the other question is like, does the U.S. have a good reason to do this, right? You, 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 after all, are someone who was tracked by, surveilled by, by ByteDance. And so I guess I wonder, like, is, is the, the, the government's reasoning behind this legit or how legit? Yeah, I mean, the really unsatisfying answer there is we don't know and we're not likely to know because a lot of... The, the, the assessment of threats that goes on behind the scenes for CFIUS is often informed by classified government intelligence. And the, the, the draft agreement, of course, did not have any classified material in it because it went to bite dance. Um, but the underlying considerations, when, when the government is deciding, is this thing a threat or not, they're looking at a bunch of confidential intelligence that we don't have. And so... We are in the difficult position of having to trust the government and trust that we would agree with their assessment of classified, you know, human intelligence about what's actually going on in, on the ground in China. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I would agree with the assessment of threats or not. What I do know is that um, the Trump administration and the Biden administration have have both been fairly firm that they think this thing is a threat. And um, that so far as we know, the government, if 
has not signed this agreement or has not come to a final agreement because they are still worried about threats, which suggests that it's not that they don't think an agreement is necessary. It's that they think an agreement isn't strong enough. And again, if you think an agreement is not strong Hmm. enough, then then what else are you going to do? Because like you said, the political reality seems to seems to suggest that if they were going to do something, they'd want to do it now. You talk to a number of free speech advocates who look at this thing and say like, uh, this does not bode well for the future. And I, I guess I wonder, like, does this mean anything for other social media companies? Or is this case totally unique to TikTok? I think a lot of the issues that we're worried about on TikTok we're worried about with other companies too, right? We're talking essentially about sort of propaganda campaigns, disinformation campaigns, and censorship issues. And we're talking about data privacy. Those are two issues that we have talked a lot about when we talk about Facebook, when we talk about Meta, um, and and we talk about Google and other massive companies. But there's this there's this geopolitics layer that I think makes those issues salient to a new group of folks who weren't necessarily tuned into those conversations about domestic platforms, but are tuned into those conversations about TikTok. I will say, I think it is like very, very, very probable that there will be other tech companies. Like TikTok isn't going to stay on top forever. No company ever does. There will be other platforms in the future. And they're probably not going to be based in the United States, not because there's something wrong with the United States, but because it's a big world out here. And it seems like it was just an anomalous little American exceptionalist bubble that we were living in that we didn't have this happen to us until now. And so I fully expect that there will be foreign platforms um, that are very powerful engines of speech in the future. And I hope that our conversation about TikTok, wherever it lands, can, can help us think about what to do about the sort of massive power of these platforms in a, an international, you know, sort of politically connected age. This is a draft agreement. This was from last year. Has anyone come to you and said, no, no, this is completely irrelevant? Or yes, this is totally on the money? No one has said either of those things to me. What have they said? Both the company and the government are really constrained in what they can say. They have so far given like pretty anodyne statements saying we're working on it and and in the government's case saying we're not going to sign an agreement until we're totally comfortable with it that's what that's what they have said um so far so i don't know what has changed since this agreement uh both within like specific terms of the agreement or the status of negotiations at all we just don't know emily baker white As always, thank you for your reporting and for talking with me. Of course. It was a pleasure. Emily Baker White is a technology reporter and senior writer at Forbes. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Jonathan Fisher. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you are a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Join Slate Plus. It's the best way to support our work. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. A lot of us probably struggle with sleep hygiene, how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get restful sleep. But did you know that improving your sleep hygiene could help improve your overall health? Healthbreak, a podcast by UPMC Health Plan, dives into this topic with advice and tips you can use from our expert wellness health coaches. Listen now to find out how you can start improving your sleep at upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. That's upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. Want to feel better, get more exercise, or quit tobacco? Prescription for Wellness can improve your health with personalized sessions based on your schedule. Our expert health coaches and care managers use proven techniques. It's free for UPMC Health Plan members and could lead to the results you want. 
For more information, visit upmchp.us slash pfwellness. That's upmchp.us slash pfwellness.